And then the other thing everyone should know about me is that I have two birthdays. Today is the first one of them. Tomorrow is my second birthday, and the reason being is actually touched on in the book. Um, it's fictional, but this is part of it. Um, I went to get my driver's license when I was 17. Filled out all my paperwork July 26, July 26, July 26. Lady says, what's your birthday? July 26. Then she fills it out and she looks at her birth certificate and goes, it says July 27th. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> so I went home to my mom. I was like, mom, my birth certificate says July 27th. And she's like, oh, I don't know. It was, it was a Tuesday. Will you look at a calendar? Well, no, because it was a Tuesday. You know? <laughs> Well, you're 17, Mom. You celebrated 17 years. So. take flight from your face, when you've disappointed everyone that relies on you, when you've hurt everyone that loves you, when your internal monologue sounds like a stranger heckling you, when the physical pain mixes with the psychological agony and blurs into an inescapable cell of hurt, you listen to Johnny Cash. <laughs> Truly, as Jack drove from Rachel, there was no way he could hold his head that didn't hurt. He tried corking it to the left, to the right, laying against his chin leaning it back against the headrest, pressing it against the window, steering with his chin, and finally pressing both palms against his temple and steering with his knee. But they all resulted in the same throbbing agony. In desperation, he tried drinking a gulp of water, a disastrous idea that triggered a burst of vomiting so sudden he had no choice but to aim it into his briefcase. Every time he burped, a vile cocktail of one part vile and two parts regurgitated Irish car bomb washed over his tonsils, causing him to gag. The gag reflex led to hacking, which led to more briefcase filling and finally dry heaving. He reached into his glove compartment to, to retrieve a flask, his stomach, to calm his stomach when his hand was stopped by a book. He pulled it out and immediately recognized its piss yellow, crinkled pages. The Secret Garden. He could remember it faintly. There was a little girl, a real bratty little thing, and a boy with some type of physical defect, maybe a hunchback, or a fear of a hunchback. He couldn't remember exactly. They had both essentially lost their parents. As a child, that's everything. That's an empty nest and endless unanswered begging trips for food. But as an adult, that's just an empty nest. Life is emptiness. A flask is full, it empties, and you're alone until you refill it. But as long as you live, you'll drink. And as long as you drink, it'll empty. And who can ever stop drinking? Of course, there was a garden too, most likely a secret one. A hidden pocket of suppressed nature, dammed by walls, fed religiously with sunlight water. This is what's best for you. Just this much, at this set time. Is that love? Is the wild rose unloved? The wild rose lives at the whim of the weather. When there is drought, it suffers, perhaps dies. The garden suffers when it's neglected. The roses wither, gray, decay. Restoring a garden takes genuine devotion. A flask is restored by the pouring of another bottle into it. It is just a giving, a changing of isolation from one container to the next. One container loses everything, the other gains everything, until it, again, loses everything. Gardens, they require something more. Sunlight, water, kind words. In the wild, nature provides all of this, or it doesn't. Does nature provide it all? Mother nature has never reached a grassy palm up to feed that hungry chick. It is the nature of the mother to provide, a different nature, but just as natural. In the wild, you have the liberty to die, the liberty to suffer. The mother's nature is to suppress those liberties, to deny the natural order. And in doing so, her nature becomes part of the natural order. But in reality, there is no order, natural or otherwise, and so often there is no mother. What then? Flasks? Empty containers? Secret gardens of misery and unbounded gravity? Hordes of deep-seated, prickly torment tended to by defective children? Jack decided he'd better return the book to Miss Lyon before he ended up getting his face clawed off like Erica. Maybe she'll want the briefcase too, he groaned to himself as he pulled up to the curb. It'll match the rest of the house. As he opened his car door, a gust of wind whistled by. It was chilly. He wouldn't be long. As he slowly descended the corroding staircase, he saw Miss Lyon standing on the bench in the yard, shrouded by the speckless sunlight creeping through a willow tree. Whenever the wind circled through between the hillside and the house, her gray hair would ripple, revealing barren sections of red ashy scalp. 
her cheeks were rosy, either from the chill in the air or from drinking, and she was holding a handful of pistachios. I was just going to leave this in your mailbox, Jack said, flashing to the book. My daughter finished reading it. Miss Lyon smiled, a gummy clown grin with one large prop tooth at the center. Oh, good. What did she think of it? That's when Jack saw it. The squirrel. Its beady, devious, man-hating eyes. Its vicious, malicious, flesh ripping claws and its sharp, maniacal, man-eating teeth. It was sawing through a pistachio shell like a table saw through a sheet of plywood. What in the name of Walmart is that squirrel doing here, Jack asked, <laughs> fighting back the urge to heave at the offensive creature. This is Luke, Miss Lyon smiled warmly at the creature. This little darling visits me every afternoon. I feed him pistachios. You feed delicious pistachios to that monster? <laughs> We're all monsters, Jack. This little darling is sweeter than any person I've ever known. She tossed a nut down to the anticipating squirrel, who was standing on his hind legs with his hands clasped together in a prayer position. Immediately, he dug into the nut. He chewed from the opening of the shell around the unopened part and back to the unopened end, repeatedly until he had chewed the shell in half, releasing the nut, which disappeared into his mouth as soon as it appeared. So, tell me, what did your daughter think? Jack handed her the book, The Secret Garden. He thought about the walls of trash just on the other side of her door, standing in a rose like a rose garden. And he thought about Erica. All she had tried to do was help. She hated it. She couldn't decide if she ever cared about the characters. It wasn't a complete loss, though. She did learn the word mediocre from reading it. <laughs> she sounds like a bright young lady, Miss Lyons said placidly. That's a very astute, thoughtful assessment. She tossed another nut to Luke. You know, Erica was just trying to help. Jack said with a tone approaching a parental reprimand. I didn't want her help, Jack, Miss Lyon said coldly. Another pistachio. You're dying, he said. The blood had run out of his tone. What did you expect her to do? Spend every night drinking at the sizzler with you, piling on the dirt? Jack, Miss Lyon said in the patient tone he had heard every year when his, when his teacher would invariably try to explain his attitude was destroying his potential. On my mother's side, my grandfather is English, and my grandmother is Scot-Irish. On my father's side, my grandfather is French and Mongolian, my grandmother Italian. You see, my family tree has been killing each other off since the beginning of civilization. The only logical progression is that I kill myself. Some people do it quickly, and some people kill themselves every day of their lives. And even when they're not killing themselves, all of their decisions are subconsciously leaning that way, so it's only a matter of time before their ambition is fulfilled. There's nothing subconscious about what you're doing anymore. I'm broken, Jack. There's nothing left but dull roots and pain. In order for something to regrow, someone has to water it, and someone has to prune it, too. And pruning hurts. Jack, both the deluge and fire were new life, but both cause mudslides, too. I didn't want her to save me. It'd be too painful at this point. I just wanted a friend for these last hours. But she didn't give me her friendship. She gave me maids. Friendship? Jack scoffed. You think she is the one that didn't give you her friendship? You wouldn't even go to her graduation. You slapped her, and she apologized to you. For someone who keeps everything, you throw friends away like they're the only things you can't find a place for in your piles of crap. You're right about me, of course, Miss Lane agreed wistfully, tossing another nut. So wrong about yourself, Jack. You reek of tequila and self-despair. My life may seem foul to you now, but you'll understand. You, of all people, will understand. Some people run from their demons. Others sit down and have cocktails with theirs. You and I, we can't even recognize ourselves without our demons. I doubt you've ever looked your demons in the eye. I wouldn't dare to. I'd rather wake in the morning with an empty bed and a one night regret than other names. That's how we're different. I know all my demons by name. Do you? Do you have any idea how completely you let everyone in your life down? My refrigerator is still busted. I don't let everyone down. Once you get used to disappointing yourself, you don't even notice when you disappoint others. Jack, a costume was never going to work with a girl like Erica. You might as well have worn a handlebar mustache and called yourself Duke Orsina, because there was no way she was ever going to love you. That's the difference between the two of us. I know no one will ever love me. You're still clinging to the fantasy that there's something interesting about you. But you'll join me soon enough. The only thing interesting about the two of us is our room. Being a hoarder isn't interesting. It's just gross. We're all hoarders, Jack. Some of us have more to show for it than others. 
It's not the mess on the outside that kills you, yes, but it's the mess on the outside that gives you a rash. Oh, Miss Lyons smirked, shaking her head. I'm sure you spread far more rashes than my living room. On the bench next to Miss Lyons was a ripe peach. She picked it up and scrutinized it with a sour expression. Damn it, she hissed. It's a worm in my peach. Fixated, she sat examining the worm burning in and out of the peach. His head buried, his rear sticking out like a slime covered moon. As she get going, Jack pressed his palms to his forehead and lamented to himself that a slap would have been far less painful than the incessant talking. I have a father daughter dance to attend. I'm sure you're an outstanding father, she said, dismissively, still regarding the worm. You know, Jack, she looked up at him. With your hair long like that, you're the spitting image of Christ. A hungover, dehydrated, and foul smelling Christ the morning after mirror for the wine. But Christ all the same. Jack smiled, a painful mo movement he regretted immediately. Yeah, I get that a lot. Ironic, huh? Like dying on a cross for a heaven you know doesn't exist. Jack walked away. As he reached the eroding staircase, he looked back at Miss Lyon. She was staring at the peach, her face contorted into a severe frown, her cheeks hollow, right eye twitching. She was all alone in the yard, sitting on the wobbly bench, in the middle of the yellow grass beneath the overgrown and cobweb jumping willow. A good gardener could have the yard immaculate in a couple weeks. Any average painter could transform the gray, cracked exterior of the house into something warm and inviting in just a matter of days. Yet it all seems so hopeless now, lifetimes beyond sorrow, except for the squirrel who knew only ravenous hunger. Oh, wow.